Good morning. Good morning. If you can hear my voice, why don't you make your way into the sanctuary? Psalm 8, 1. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all earth, in all the earth. There's this TV show that my son likes, and it's a nature show, and it talks about different animals and the different design that they have and what's so unique about it. And nine times out of ten, I usually find myself watching it more than he does. And I learn something each time, and it's so cool just to see God's fingerprint on all of creation. I can see him in the waves. I can see his majesty displayed in the heavens, his beauty in the sunset. And at the pinnacle of all of his creation, he made us with his fingerprint on us. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Why don't you stand with me and let's worship our king together.
there's no end to your magnificence, Lord. There's no end to your glory. This morning, thinking about, Lord, what you've done for us on the cross, all we need to do is draw near. <laughs> draw near to you, Lord, and accept what you've done for us, Lord. You cover everything. You cover our sins, Lord. You forgive it as if it never has happened, Lord. You cover our sicknesses, the things we need freedom in, Lord. You set us free as we gather this morning, Lord. I thank you that that is true, Lord. show us more of who you are. Final breath. 
I believe in this moment that the Lord wants to do something right now. I believe if, he's, if there's anything holding you back, any sickness, any disease, anything in your heart, in your soul, your emotions that has been holding you back, any sickness, I believe that Jesus is your healer and he hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. He knows what you've been praying for on your knees at night. He knows what's keeping you awake. He knows what weighs heavy on your soul that you need a balm of healing right now. I believe right now the Lord wants to heal. He wants to heal the brokenhearted. He came to restore. So we're gonna go sing this again. Have that on your heart. Lay it before his feet. The Lord wants to heal. Father God, we lay these before you. Jesus, your blood was poured out for, for our redemption. But God, you also came to restore and to heal. Lord, I pray that you seal these on our hearts right now, God. We praise you. We thank you. You are holy. You are majestic. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Riley, if we haven't had a chance to meet, and welcome to High Point Church. We exist to cultivate real faith and real life. We value that each person grows in their relationship with God in community with God's people. We've got a few things coming up in the next two weeks that will jumpstart your spiritual growth. So we have coming up is Victory Day. If you've been walking with the Lord for any strength, any length of time, and there's just some things that have been holding you down, some repetitive sins that keep you chained up, or anything, you just need breakthrough and freedom, you should be at this, uh, you should be here at Victory Day. We'll be experiencing and seeing and activating the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that you're gonna wanna miss. On then the next day, May, May 5th, this Sunday, we have baptisms, which is very exciting. If you want to take the next step in your spiritual walk with the Lord and you've never been baptized and we'd like to have that outward expression of what's happening in your heart, be sure to register on your app for that. You can actually register for both Victory Day and the baptism on your app or in the connection booth out those doors right there. If this is your first time here and you'd love to get connected, we would like to get connected with you guys. Um, you can through the Connection Center out there as well, or you can scan the QR code behind me. And if you have any prayer requests, this is one of the fastest ways for us to be standing in prayer with you. So you can scan that QR code and write your prayer request. We'd love to be in prayer with you. Thank you for being generous with your tithes and offerings. There are three ways that you can give. You can give through the black boxes in the back of the sanctuary. You can give online through your bank, and you can also give securely through the High Point app. Let me pray for the tithes and offerings. Father God, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, and in return as an act of worship, we give them back to you. God, we lay before you on your, at your feet these monetary values, our hours, our time, our money here at your feet, Lord. I pray that it is a sweet aroma to your throne. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Riley. Good morning. If you've not had the pleasure to meet, my name is Keith. I'm the lead pastor here. This is Pastor Mario, the 
the phantom sliding around. I would like to invite up the Steele family, if you would. We have a baby dedication uh, today. This is Bethany and Sam Steele and their little bundle of joy, Sullivan. Come on up. If there's any family members, if you want to move to wherever you get the best pictures, by all means, do. Wow. Okay. Hold on. When you're dependent on technology, sometimes it gets a mind of its own. All right. Awesome. So we are going to dedicate Solomon, or Solomon, Sullivan. I'm going to just stick with Sully. How's that? All right. We're going to dedicate Sully. Uh, today, and um, we don't we don't baptize infants. We do have a baptism coming up, by the way, on uh, May fifth. If that's a your next step of faith, but we believe here that baptism is something that uh, happens after an individual makes their own personal profession of faith. That's how Scripture lays it out. Uh, but sometimes parents will want to come and bring their child before the people of God and dedicate them. So that's what this moment is. Um, and we're going to take some time. We're going to pray for Sullivan, and we're going to believe God that he's going to have a couple things to, to share. But let's go ahead and jump in. Bethany and Sam, God has chosen you, just as he chose Abraham, to help establish his covenant in the earth. For he has said of Abraham that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall obey the Lord and practice righteousness and justice. Sam and Bethany, as you have brought Sullivan before the Lord, and before this gathering to dedicate him to God's service, so also does it require you to come and renew your commitment to him and to his people. For the burden of raising a child that fears the Lord is significant and can only be properly carried out by parents whose hearts are yielded to Jesus. So, Bethany and Sam, I adjure you to seek the Lord with all your heart, to never let your ear become dull of hearing his word, to never let your eyes tire of seeing his glory and to never let your hearts become callous to his touch. I admonish you to be an example to Sullivan in word and deed, to discipline him with love and to nurture within him a heart that hungers after God. I ask you to never forget that he has been given to your stewardship. He is not yours to train as you wish, but he is wholly the Lord's and you must now inquire of the Lord how you should raise him. Create within your home an atmosphere of worship Sam, love Bethany, your wife, as Christ loved the church. Bethany, love and respect Sam, your husband, as the church is to love and respect Christ. Love the Lord and serve him. Enjoy the brief moments that he has given you with your precious little Sullivan. Make the most of every opportunity. Do not live your life, your lives always needing to make time for him, but prioritize well and make time for everything else. Watch your child grow and in the process, grow with him. Sam and Bethany, if you desire to adhere to these admonitions, will you please respond by saying, by the grace of God, we will. May the Lord bless all your efforts in the care and protection of Solomon. By attending this ceremony, you are pledging your support to this family. You are saying that I will help in the godly rearing of this child, and I ask that you pray for them and encourage them as they seek the Father's will. High Point family, will you support this family through your prayers? Will you encourage them to grow strong in faith that is in Christ Jesus? Will you help them in times of trouble? Will you stand with them as they stand with the Lord? Will you remind them of the covenant that they've made before God and before this gathering to let Jesus be the Lord of their home? Will you help them when necessary by being their brother's and children's keeper? If you will, members of High Point Church, please respond by saying, by the grace of God we will. pray for Solomon. And sometimes in the process of praying for a child, um, sometimes God just gives you a little bit of insight. So we're going to maybe, we're going to pray some specific things and then we're going to pray a couple things, Pastor Mario and I, that we believe God wants you to know about this great and mighty young man. We're going to anoint him with oil. Sullivan, I dedicate you to God in the name of the Father. Son and Holy Spirit, I loose you from the powers of darkness. May your young life be nurtured and matured under the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit. May God protect you physically and deliver you from temptation. May he call you early into his service, 
using you to courageously advance the glory of his name. May you be passionate toward Jesus and devoted to his word. May wisdom mark your decisions. May humility mark your achievements. May purity mark your relationships. And may service mark your approach to your fellow man. May you bring much joy to your family and may you be a blessing to your parents. In Jesus' name. So as we were praying for Solomon, I, I just, I felt like I kept hearing God say this word, strong. Strong and strength over and over and over and over. And he's going to be, Bethany, you're going you're gonna to know that God's confirming this word to you because he's going to want to show you how strong he is all the time. Like if you're, if you're opening a jar, he's going to be like, you know, and if you do like, even like, even if you're faking it, just a little like, oh, this is hard. He's going to be like, I got it, mom. Watch, you know, you know, or, and even if he doesn't get it, he's going to have loosened it for you. Like he's going to constantly be when you're carrying things in from the car, like, you know, no, I can carry more. Like he's just, he, God's going to give him like significant physical strength compared to maybe to his size, compared to maybe those around him. He's just going to be a strong dude. You know, he'll be able to lift stuff. He'll be able to move stuff. Sam, someday when you're, hey, we got to grab the couch and you're tempted to call Mario or by then you're really old, broken down pastor. Your, you know, your son's going to be like, I got it, dad. Like there's just going to be a, a, a quickness to kind of show his strength. But it's not just going to be where he's going to be physically strong and physically wanting to show you that. God's going to make him a man of very strong convictions and very strong principles. Um, in some ways, uh, it's going to be really crucial that you help him really know right from wrong because when he decides, he's going to lock in. And when he knows that this is of the Lord or when he knows that like this is the right thing to do in a situation, um, he's going to have a real strength that others around him aren't. He's not going to be a uh, wishy-washy. is not going to be um, in his makeup whatsoever. He's going to be a man of conviction. He's going to be a man of principles. Uh, someday when he's you know, uh, marrying his, his wife, that they're gonna know exactly what he's about. Like there's gonna be no kinda, huh, I wonder where you stand on things. Not in a like arrogant or pushy way, he's gonna consider them, but then when he decides, and he's gonna be dis always looking to go, what is, what is right? What is proper? What is, what is the Lord in this situation? So as you train him to follow God, train him to hear God's voice, train him to, to, to read the word and figure out how to apply it to his life. Uh, when he looks and goes, man, this is right. And he, the only way he'll be movable on things is when he realizes that he wasn't right, right? Because I mean, he, you know, he'll learn things at nine about God that he's gonna go, this is true. And then at 16, he's gonna go, wow, this is actually more true. Like I understand this better. And he'll let go of things that were wrong. He's not gonna be stubborn. He'll let go of things that were wrong because he's gonna have a deep strength, deep desire to hold on to what's right and true. Um, so he's not gonna be one that you're gonna have to worry about him getting in the weeds and falling for stuff as long as you let him know what's right. And, and that, that would be a lot in my vocabulary with him. I would, as you're raising him, like, hey son, this is the right thing to do. Son, this is, this is how men approach this situation. This is what God would say a, a, about this. And he'll, he'll hear those things, he'll really internalize them, and he'll hold on to those with great strength. Yeah. So what I was hearing the Lord saying when I was praying for Sully and you guys is the word shepherd. Mm. Not because you like sheep, but because he is called to lead. Yeah. The word that Pastor Keith says, strong and convictions, but he has the willingness to go first, not because he's your firstborn, but God is calling him to lead. It's going to give him that mantle of shepherding people. People will be drawn to him and they will see him as somebody who they can trust and they can follow. And I want to let you know, it's not gonna be a burden that he cannot carry because he has great parents that, they can learn, that he can learn from to lead as well. So, and he's not gonna be leading on his own, his own strength either, but with the strength of the Lord. Yeah. I, pray? I also, yeah, I'll have you pray for them, but I also just want to tell you, Bethany, of, of, of all the things you've done, you were made for this. You were, God made you to raise a strong young man. And if you, if you ever wrestle with, oh, what should I do with my job? Or what should I do with other things in life? Like the Holy Spirit's gonna just 
show you and empower you and grace you and anoint you. Like you talk about running with the wind at your back, you're gonna be an awesome mom. If you've ever had worries about that, I don't know what kind of mom am I gonna be? Well, let me just confirm it. You're gonna be an excellent mom. You're gonna be the kind of mom that people are gonna go, okay, how did you do that? Like, what are you, what are you doing? And God's just, he has a real grace on you uh, to be a mom. So, Mario, why don't you pray for this incredible family? Ooh. Father, we thank you for Sam, Bethany, and Sully in the family. We thank you, Father, that you are leading them and calling them to lead. Thank you that you are watching over them. Thank you that you are giving them the strength to overcome any obstacle. And because your grace abounds in their lives. Thank you, Father, that you have given them to us as friends and members of our church. But most importantly, Lord, that they belong to you and that you will watch over them every step of the way. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Give it up for this incredible family. Great. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Aiden. We're good. All right. Well, we're going to jump into God's Word again. As I mentioned, my name is Keith. We haven't had the privilege to meet. Um, I have a daughter that lives up in Washington, D.C., and I was up there not too long ago, just on a quick visit. And um, <clears throat> if you know anything about Washington, D.C., it's that people uh, in that city particularly love to express their opinions um, very loudly and very boldly and very openly. There's, you know, demonstrations and marches and signs and protests. Like, there's always something breaking out somewhere. And uh, she lives on a building that's kind of, kind of like where, where she is, it's sort of U-shaped. So she's kind of in the middle of a U, and she can basically see the windows of these apartments and the windows of these apartments. And when I was up there, she was expressing to me this, this kind of funny, started funny, and it turned into <laughs> quite an ugly back and forth that happened between uh, her neighbors across the, the courtyard. One of them had expressed their opinion by hanging something in their window for all the world to see. And directly across, this person disagreed with that opinion and put their sign for that person to see. And this person upped the game and got a bigger, more obnoxious sign. And it, they were going back and forth to the point where this one had handwritten, like a, a handwritten poster board, I hold you in all caps, personally responsible, dot, 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 fill in, fill in the issue that they were arguing about. And she's like, I'm just sitting there because she works in that window and it's just like, I'm just sort of watching, you know, like this thing go down over the last six months. And, and I'm like, I want to make my own sign that says, tune in to our message this week because we got a series called Triggered, highpointorlando.com. We are in the second week of a series called Triggered. And in this series, we're, we're, we're learning how to respond Rather than react, Jesus responded to his friends, he responded to his enemies, he responded to circumstances, he responded to situations, he was never caught off guard, and he was never reacting out of impulse. He was responding out of principle and faith. And if we look at some of these encounters, some of them quite surprising when you realize what's happening, it's kind of like, I just wouldn't think Jesus would do that we can learn how we can respond rather than react, particularly in this day and age where everything around us is being elevated to an existential crisis, right? On a grand scale, we sit on the brink of World War III or an election that if it doesn't go the right way, of course, both sides would say it, it'll be the last election that'll ever happen or it won't matter anyway because we'll all be underwater with the climate or it won't matter anyway because your teenager will have starved to death in the next 10 minutes. Everything is amped up and existential and demanding and screaming for a reaction from us. And today we're gonna be in Mark chapter four and my hope would be that by the end of this series, in the next several weeks, that you would walk away knowing how to respond in truth rather than react in emotion to life circumstances and encounters. Mark, Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Mark 4, verses 35 to 41. Here we go. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd... They took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, 
so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Our passage starts off in verse 35 and says, On that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Jesus had spent the day ministering. He was teaching about the kingdom. He was taking care of people. He was praying for people. And he's, you know, he's been pouring out all day long, teaching, explaining the kingdom. He's given out, and we know that by the end of this, he's tired. We know because he gets on the boat and takes a nap. And it says that on that day, when evening had come, When evening had come, it's starting to get dark. You know, circadian rhythms are a good thing. Like there's a reason that your body, when it starts getting dark, there's a reason that your body starts to produce chemicals that make you drowsy. Because it's okay, even when you've been busy all day, it's okay. In fact, it's it's designed by God that we would unplug from some urgent things and rest. Circadian rhythms are a real thing, and they're a good thing. And after this day of ministry, as the evening is happening, Jesus suggested that they take a boat ride. Now, clearly, he wants to demonstrate a couple things. The most obvious thing he wants them to know about himself is that he has authority over the storms and the seas. We know that to be true. But I think he also suggests this boat ride so he can demonstrate to them that he wants us to see that it's okay to slow down and to rest. It's okay to rest. It's okay to pour yourself out. It's okay to meet people's needs. And then it is perfectly okay to shut it down. It says, and, and, and leaving the crowd. Leaving the crowd. Jesus has three years to save the world. His public ministry lasted three years. Pretty urgent ministry. He's got three years. He was just teaching, and he's looking at this crowd and going, man, they don't get it. And he's got his disciples there who he's been telling, like, I'm going to hand this entire mission to, to save the world to you to proclaim me to the ends of the earth. And he's looking at them and going, these dudes don't get it. Like, the job is undone. And his suggestion with his disciples not getting it, with the crowd not getting it, and by the way, a big crowd, his suggestion is let's go take a boat ride. (sighs) Because I need a nap. There's a crowd that needs what you have. He's clamoring desperately for what you have. How many of us would go, yeah, I'm good. In fact, let's go take a boat ride so I can take a nap. And the passage goes on. It says, and other boats were with him. Can I suggest to you, take others with you on this journey with Jesus. You'll be much more effective. You'll be much more fruitful. You get much more help. And it's a lot more fun. Like, take people with you. And by the way, there are likely others around you who want to go on the same journey with you. They just need to be invited by you. And by the way, it's not just busyness that Jesus is unplugging from. It's not just overwork and the amount of needs that are pressing in on him. It's, there, there, there's not just one boat, because sometimes we can look and go, if you had a big crowd around me, come on, introverts, heck yeah, I'm getting on a boat. 
Bye, peace out, right? But it's the, the crowd is the, is the urgency. The crowd is the need. But they don't just like unplug from the need. Other boats go with them. They've got a regatta, which means Jesus goes in the back of the boat and doesn't just sleep despite there still being needs. He goes to sleep despite there being a party. He's not affected by FOMO. How many of us can't rest for fear of missing out? I can hear him laughing. I can hear him talking about how epic my ministry just was. I can hear him talking about the future. I can hear him playing cards. He unplugged from busyness and he unplugged from phono. Goes on in verse 37. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. A great windstorm. Not just any storm, a great storm. And, and, and I know when we consider, like, busyness. Like, I know, uh, I know everybody's busy, but I'm super busy. Like, it's not just a storm. Everybody has storms. I'm in a particularly great storm. I know you're busy, but you have no idea how, like, super busy I am. I know nobody has enough time, <laughs> but I have even less free time. I know that things aren't going anyone's way, but, but I'm facing extraordinary headwinds. You know, it's one thing, Pastor Keith, you're talking to them, but you know the size of my storm. This isn't an average storm that rolls up. It says it's a great one, and look what it says. The waves are breaking into the boat. So what's happening out there on the water is getting into the boat. What's happening out there in the storms of life is getting in here. What's happening out there is so great that it's getting in here. What's happening external is such that it's really starting to affect and break through and affect me internally. And then it says that the boat was already filling, which is literal water in the boat, but how many of us feel so overwhelmed that it feels like we're filling up? Like, if I don't do something right now, I'm gonna sink. I mean, I hear you, Pastor Keith, take a nap, unplug. You know, if I do, I drown. Like, to stop is to sink. I'll, I'll sleep some other time. I can't right now. The boat is taking on water. But the thing about Jesus is his actions are never dictated to him by the circumstances. He decides to rest when he decides to rest. And the boat taking on water and freaking everybody out is of no deterrence to him doing the right thing to do at the moment. He chooses, and he doesn't let circumstances dictate to him. And here's the thing. We, it says that he's in the stern asleep. The disciples are in the storm. Jesus is in the stern. Let me say that again. The disciples are in the storm. Jesus has found a nice, comfy, cushioned place to retreat. You don't have to stay in the front of the boat getting battered. You need to establish and develop for yourself a stern. Where do I go? And I don't mean escapism. I don't mean get online and just lose yourself forever. I don't mean just put on the headphones, get in your comfy chair and game for 24 hours. I'm not talking about escaping reality. 
I'm talking about sleeping through storms that shouldn't be bothering you. Do you have a place where you can retreat and find comfort in God? They're in the storm. He's in the stern. And here's the thing to keep in mind, because some, sometimes we can look and go, okay, well, I just gotta, I just gotta keep grinding, because at some point, you know, the storm will end. I know I was busy over here, but man, if I, you know, I'm, if I can just get to the other side of the lake. Here's the thing. It's rough on the other side of the lake, too. Can we just be honest? Jesus had been doing ministry, pouring himself out. He gets on the boat. He's going on the boat to teach him a lesson, but he's also going on the boat to show them that he doesn't just have power over the wind and whatever. There's a crazy demoniac on the other side of the lake. He's on his way to do more ministry. So he's not waiting for life to just finally, you know, hit like this easy place. Can we be honest? There aren't any anymore. You're between pouring yourself out over here and pouring yourself out over here. You're leaving one place on your way to the next. You and I have to know when it's okay to not also deal with the storm in between. You and I have to make determinations that sometimes the best thing to do is to get in the stern and go to bed. I am famous around our household for us being way too busy and Jennifer going, we're way too busy. We need to change things. And I'm like, things are going to change as if things are going to cut us a break. Oh, no, no. We just got to get through like the next month. And she's like, have you looked at the following month on the calendar? And I'm like, no, I don't do that. My stern of the boat is to avoid the calendar. (laughs) Of course I'm not. I would perish. So what I'm going to do is delude myself that next month is going to be better than this one. And she's like, it's not, it, the situation isn't going to change. The change has to happen with us in intentionality to go, that was busy, that's busy, it's raining, good night. We have to have spaces and places where we know how to, Relax. The passage goes on. And it says, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Look at this. Do you not care? We are perishing. The demand of people on your time is always loaded with Do you care? The demand of situations and circumstances on your time are always, what if you don't deal with this? You won't survive. Do you not care? When people draw on us, they almost always either make it or we feel like it's being made about whether or not we care. Oh my gosh, the latest controversy, I have to post something, or what? People will think I don't care. I gotta comment, I gotta change my icon, I have to make some type of statement, or people will think I don't care. I don't care whether you think I care. Because I would hope that the totality of my life would demonstrate that I do. I mean, you understand what Jesus had already done for these guys at a very intentional and deliberate and sustainable pace, and you knew what he was going to be demonstrating to them. (laughs) Like, care? Love? Seriously? Just hang in the boat a little longer, boys. Right? Wait till I hike up that hill. Like, like let, let, the, let the breadth of your relationship with people speak about how you care. But Pastor Keith, what about those people that aren't around me? I don't care <laughs> whether they, who I have not spoken to with all due respect since 30 years ago in high school, 
whether they think I care about the thing that they're super agitated about. Therefore, I'm going to go online and I haven't spoken to them in 30 years and won't. It's okay. We, we have to come to grips with the fact that something that feels urgent to someone else doesn't have to, have to, have to dominate us with the same level of urgency. That doesn't mean that you don't care. I'm joking that I don't care. Like, but I personally, for me, especially on social media, I would much rather sit down with you and have a nuanced conversation about whatever you want to talk about. I'll be happy to tell you what I believe, but I'm not going to post it because 140 characters isn't enough to explain the nuance of what I think about how the gospel applies to that area of life. So let's chat. It's okay. And if in the meantime, I'm tempted to think that you think that I'm not thinking, uh, I realize that most people are way too self-absorbed to worry about what I'm doing. Don't you care? We are perishing. There is no record of anyone dying in that storm. There is no record of anyone falling overboard in that storm. There's no record of anyone's demise, yet they're not saying we might perish. They are, we are actively in the process of dying. <laughs> Really? Huh. Because y'all are making a whole lot of noise for a bunch of dying people. You woke me up, right? But, but, but th there's this sense when people are amped about something or us, if I don't respond, then we will fill in the blank. We're going to perish. And when we're overwhelmed with life and storms and stuff and FOMO and busyness, when we're overwhelmed, every situation appears equally dire. When we feel like we have to respond and we cannot sleep until we do, it's usually because we feel that the consequences of our inaction have grown to become life or death. And again, this cultural moment that we live in, every situation is screaming life and death at us. It's why, by the way, we have a massive rise in anxiety in our culture. Because if everything is an existential crisis, the world will end unless that's a lot of weight for a human being to bear, especially considering you can't do jack about any of them. Overwhelming consequences and an inability to control them creates high anxiety. But here's the thing. You and I do not need to respond to everything that others deem to be urgent. Not every storm needs heightened urgency from you. It's okay to sleep through some of the storms. Not every online battle needs your engagement. Not every fire in the workplace requires you. And when you're tired from doing what's good and right, take a nap. It's okay. It goes on in verse 39. And the passage says, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He quiets the storm. Now, I can't prove this theologically, but I think he did so, so that he could go finish his nap. That's what I think happened. But I do know this, that instead of reacting to the disciples' urgent need, he responds 
with the peace that was in him. Y'all didn't hear me. Instead of their frantic response getting into him, the peace that's in him gets into the situation. Y'all still didn't hear me. The world around you needs the peace that is in you. The world needs your peace more than it needs your response. Because your response will add to the cacophony, your peace will add to the stillness. Okay, let's keep going because you're almost there. Come on, somebody give me something. What gets other people who do not have Jesus with them, what gets them frantic should not make us frantic. The fact that we have Jesus should bring about peace and calm where we go. There's this phrase out there that everybody likes to throw around in the Christian world now called a non-anxious presence. Jesus is a non-anxious presence. You know who else should be a non-anxious presence? The people of Jesus. There should be something about your presence in an angsty situation that is not angsty. Because the same spirit that gave Jesus a non-anxious presence lives within you and me. And can I tell you, he ain't freaking out. He's calm. There's a saying among the special forces, when the going gets tough, the tough relax. And that should be the case for the people of God. Look at what it says. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Hmm. It's a great calm. Where did I hear great just a minute ago? Oh, yeah, a great storm. The greater the storm, the greater your calm's effect can have. The greater the storm, the greater a need for peace to come out of the people of God. All Jesus does is wake up and say three words. And a great storm that has everybody freaking out and doubting him settles everything. Peace. What's in me is now going to come out and change what's happening out there. Peace. And let me just double down. Be still. The, the truth is that sometimes us as the people of God have a hard time being a non-anxious, calming presence because the storm's already gotten in. Our boat feels like it's sinking. And even if it doesn't feel like it's sinking, I gotta, I gotta drive the whole thing while feeding the kids and washing laundry and dealing with my boss. Like there's, there's too much. And, and I kind of think right now in this moment that God wants to speak over you peace and be still. You don't have to raise your hand. But if you're sitting in this place right now, and the storms that are happening there have gotten in here. And I think about all the things that are beyond my control, but they're going to affect me. Or I feel the things that are beyond my control, and they're affecting me. If that's you, heaven's got three words for you right now. May the peace of God reign over your heart and over your mind right now in the name of Jesus that you could walk and truly everywhere that the sole of the foot of your foot treads from this moment forward, peace would come out of you. And for the storms that are true and valid, I just say in the name of Jesus, be still.
wind stop, sea is flattened, the tumult and storms inside, we speak great calm over you. In the name of Jesus. Passage goes on. In verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Pretty good question for us. Why are you afraid to take a nap? Why are you afraid to rest? Why are you afraid to stop? Is it a lack of faith? Do we trust God? This is what he's saying there. And he's saying to us, do we trust God to do even when we are not doing? Do we trust that God can act without our help? Is God capable of moving a situation even when I stop moving? Do we trust him to control that which we cannot We are not in control of the weather, but he is. So relax, trust him, have faith in him, and take a nap. Concludes with verses 41. It says, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? He says, great fear. Sometimes fear is actually terror, and then other times the word there, fear, could be translated awe, and this is one of those. So great awe came upon them. Who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? They were filled with great awe. There are things that obey God that do not obey you. There are situations that will yield to him that do not yield to you, which means you can rest even if you can't fix everything. If you can't make them yield, you don't have to keep bailing the boat. You just need to realize they yield to him. So may that put in your heart great awe. See, Jesus could rest. Worship team, help me out. Jesus could rest because he knew, they're just figuring out, but he knew that the wind and the waves obeyed him. And you can rest too because the wind and the waves obey him. He's in charge. He calms stuff like that. I'm a boat guy. Been boating my whole life. And here's the thing. Wind and waves obey each other. The wind starts on a calm sea, and when the wind comes, the water starts moving in response to the wind. And once those waves start... Those waves keep going until they hit something immovable like the land. And then they stop. Jesus calms them both. The wind stops, but when wind stops, waves still go, unless, of course, one has authority over both. And the reality is some of you trust God with the wind, but not with the waves. You're good with him going, okay, he'll hold this back, but you know what he can also do is not require the natural process to run its full course and eventually hit land. He can also go, done. And because he can do that, we can rest. 
So as we close on a worship song, here's what I would like you to do. I want you to contemplate a couple things. I want you to consider, as the song will eventually build up, I want you to consider what storms, what circumstances do you need to entrust to God right now? What storms can you ask him right now as we're worshiping to speak peace be still into so that you can rest? I want you to call those to mind and I want you just to invite God to take them over. And some of you are in a good, calm, still place. But I would like for you to consider how much more peace can exist in our community if we all responded rather than reacted. And some of you just need to let him calm storms and some of you just need to let him still you so that you can bring that still out into your surroundings. Jesus, you're good, your word is true. Every word that's come out of your mouth is helpful and useful and true and amazing and anointed and not one word you've ever spoken to us has ever fallen short. So I'm asking with the same power that is on your written word, would that power infuse the three words we're asking you for as we worship you of peace, be still, may they not fall short for your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand as we contemplate these things? Bring it before the Lord.
Amen. Amen. Let me send you out on this verse. It is in Psalms 1, 1 through 2. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who med meditates on his law day and night. Let this word meditate on your heart day and night. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.